brings us to uh, the British colonies of North America. Uh, and so it was in 1800s, early 1800s, that they started establishing what we call the Indian Reserve System. They set aside large plots of land, like 1,200 acres of land for my community in New Brunswick in 1802. Uh, 20,000, 200,000 acres of land for in, in Red Bank, New, New Brunswick, and on the Miramichi. Uh, so there were big, big swaths of land that were reserved for Indians. And then when the Loyalists left, what happened is they settled themselves on those reserves, and because their, their governments were uh, relatives of theirs, their uncles, their aunts, and whatever, what they called the Loyalist uh, Compact, the original settlers were disaffected Loyalists from Boston, New Hampshire, New York, and so on. And so they, they decided to give them, their relatives lands that belonged to the Cadian people, the, the French people. Then they gave themselves land that belonged to Indians, uh, parts of the reserve lands, and so on and so forth. So finally, by, by 1867, uh, they had developed policies in the colonial areas of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and they had uh, commissioners of Indian affairs who were managing the reserve lands. They had Indian acts to determine uh, how, how they would provide uh, uh, survival, sustenance for the Indians, because they were slowly being uh, captured on, on small pieces of land, and they were told, don't trespass on those territories around you. And so the Indian people couldn't, could no longer sustain themselves from the birds, plants, animals, and fish to be able to obtain their, their food and medicine, their shelter, their tools of survival, their modes of travel. And so when the government of Canada formed in 1867 with the British North American Act, which is really an act that belongs to England, and it is a British law that created the government of Canada. A federal law, section 9124 and section 9092, one are the responsibilities. Section 91 is all the responsibilities of the federal government. Section 92 are all the responsibilities of the provincial governments, including like education in the provinces. They also deal with uh, highways in the provinces, roads, bridges. Uh, they also dealt with uh, uh, trees, plants, uh, birds, fish, and uh, uh, certain laws. And then the federal government took the responsibility because they were the closest to the, to the British crown with the governor general representing the British government. They said, well, since those treaties are still unfulfilled promises of the British crown, we'll take responsibility for the Indians. We'll look after them. So the provinces stayed out, out of looking after the Indians because they were slowly being into small uh, pieces of land. And so they were basically starving to death because they were not having the sustenance that they used to have before in terms of having the caribou, the, mar the moose, and the deer populations going past and migrating here and during the winter and the summer and so on and so forth. So they were slowly being corralled. And by 1876, the federal government of Canada developed an Indian Act, an act to protect the rights of indigenous peoples in Canada and Indian people, and the right to protect the, the Indian reserves set aside as lands for Indians, specifically for the Indians. And 50 years ago, I used to see signs on our reserve uh, saying, no trespassing, this is Indian land. White people were not allowed to go into Indian reserves as early as 1950s, 60s. My uncle, Willie John Simon, was a policeman, and he was given the responsibility of enforcing those trespass, trespassing laws of the federal government. So the Department of Indian Affairs system uh, whereby we will elect our, our chiefs. And so beginning in the 1880s, our people were told, now you have to do a democratic uh, process in electing your leaders. And so our people 
elected the traditional leaders that had been on the Mi'kmaq Grand Council from before, from a long time ago. In going back to the creation story, these seven chiefs, heads of these seven original clans and families. Uh, so they, they were the ones that are, were our traditional leaders. But the Federal Department of Indian Affairs said, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't, you can't elect your traditional leaders. They're, we said we're, we're not recognizing the traditional forms of governance. These call, they were called life chiefs. When, when the life chief dies, well, we're no not longer going to have this system anymore. So, uh, but the Indians kept electing their, the respected elders and the respected leaders that they knew as their leaders. And there was lots of letter writing back and forth with lawyers and, and chiefs who hired lawyers to Indian Affairs telling them, look, uh, our people elected us. They nominated us, they elected us, and we're hereditary chiefs and we're elected chiefs, all in one. So Minister, Superintendent of Indian, Minister of Indian Affairs or Superintendent of Indian Affairs issued a letter to the chief saying, you're, you're not recognized, you're, you're dismissed a chief under the Indian Act. So we're going to have another election. And they, they had other elections. And the people nominated the same people and elected them again. And this happened three times over in some of the reserves. And, and so finally the Federal Department of Indian Affairs and said, oh, well, let them be. And uh, as soon as these elders and leaders die off, we'll, we won't recognize the, the old system. But uh, guess what? I'm still here <laughs> as a hereditary chief. Uh, and I'm still recognized by my own people as, as uh, their traditional uh, respected knowledge keeper, um, holder of their traditional creation story, uh, a carrier of, of their sacred pipe. And, and so it is uh, a wonder that our people survived in the middle of 1800s, around 1850, there were only 1,500 Mi'kmaq people left in the Maritimes. 1,500. And we've, we've managed to, to uh, intermarry with the Irish, the Scottish, the French, and, and build our culture, our Mi'kmaq society, back to roughly around 40,000 today. That's how many people are of Mi'kmaq ancestry live in the Maritimes. There's some living in Boston, there's some living in, in Maine, and because of this course, there's some, we found out there's some living in Texas, some in California, some in British Columbia, some in Vancouver, and, and they're signing up for this course to learn more about their culture and traditions. So, uh, so that brings us to the Indian Act system which is more or less a colonialistic way of, of allowing the Indians to count them, to identify who they are. This is Stephen Augustine with band number 337 who comes from the Big Cove Reserve number 15 in New Brunswick. And so we decide who is an Indian. But guess what? There was a law under the Indian Act which, which said that any Mi'kmaq person, woman, who marries a non-native person, she'll have to give up her, her status as a Mi'kmaq. She'll no longer be a Mi'kmaq. But if I were to marry a white woman, this is before 1985, she would status as an Indian. And so there was a court case uh, that went to court. Uh, the, it was called the Sandra Lovelace case. And it, it, it married up with the uh, uh, La Valley in Ontario, and together they went to the human rights and to the federal courts of Canada, and finally the Supreme Court. They recognized that this section of the Indian Act was, was uh, discriminatory against indigenous women. And so all indigenous women who lost their status were invited to come back, and, and you're, you're Mi'kmaq now, you're Indians now, but under section 30, C31, you're, you're, and then your children are C31A, C31-1 or 2, and so on and to, to certain degrees. But still, this, if we go maybe 150 more years, uh, we'll lose uh, all status Indians in Canada.
be no longer an Indian problem in Canada <laughs> because of, of the way our, our society is, is, is laid out by, by the governance structure, by the Department of Indian Affairs, by the Indian Act and by, by the virtue of status Indians and non-status Indians. And there are a lot of indigenous people with as much indigenous blood, blood as I have because I have black in my culture, I have uh, Scottish and Irish in my culture, and, and, and if I go back on my other one side, Dominiques were a people in, in Prince Edward Island. And so I'm, I'm an amalgam of all those cultures, but I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of ensconced in the Mi'kmaq culture and society, and I have a status card. I carry it with me all the time. Uh, sometimes I can get away uh, or to not pay tax uh, if I buy something in Sydney or in Halifax, but not in New Brunswick and not no longer in Ontario. 